Hello, everyone. My name is Patty Sophus. I'm a librarian at Santa Monica College, and I will present, be presenting this workshop, News Literacy and Fake News, Strategies for Evaluating the News. In this workshop, we're going to look at definitions, meaning what are we talking about? We'll look at players and mechanics of the news ecosystem. Where are the news readers in this ecosystem? And we'll look at how to detect and decipher disinformation. What is news? News is information about recent events deemed to be interesting, important, or unusual enough to be newsworthy that is gathered verified and structured in accordance with journalistic norms before being published in media ranging from newspapers to live blogs. I want you to notice that this definition is very explicit about the process that is used to create news. What is news literacy? It is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports whether they come via print, television, or the internet. Why is news important in a democracy? Shared knowledge is required for public discourse about politics and society. Accurate news helps citizens make informed decisions in a democracy. Social media and search engines have changed our access to shared knowledge in the following ways. Algorithmic news feeds and search results present different results to each person based on their tracked online behavior. This algorithmic personalization narrows people's exposure to a variety of ideas or perspectives. This can reduce the amount of accurate and shared knowledge that we have in common in a society. Think about where you go to get news. People can get news from many sources. Whatever your news habits are, you should know the hallmarks of quality journalism. Here are some essential features of quality journalism. I want to point out that when professional journalists uh, make an error, they are expected to retract, correct, and or apologize uh, for those mistakes, and they should correct misinformation quickly. The Society of Professional Journalists has a code of ethics, and I'm going to take us to that society's website so that we can look at their code of ethics. So this is their main page, but I can select, uh, I suggest that you uh, select one of these posters, a flyer or poster to see the actual code of ethics, and I'm going to go there now. So, uh, journalism is a profession, and journalists are guided by the code of ethics, which includes seeking truth and reporting it, minimizing harm, acting independently, and being accountable and transparent. I don't have to, time to go uh, into this document now and read everything, but the main thing is to know that these ethical guidelines exist, and hopefully at some point, if you're interested, you can go back and take a look at them. Just bear with me, I'm sorry, I'm going back to our PowerPoint. Okay. If we define bias as a point of view or perspective, then all news outlets are biased. But this does not mean that the content is false. The human tendency is to dismiss sources that have a bias different from our own bias also known as confirmation bias. All Sides is a media literacy company with the methodology for rating bias of media outlets on a political spectrum from left to right. All Sides uses multiple methods to rate media bias, 
including editorial reviews, blind bias surveys, independent reviews, and third-party research. Let me show you the All Sides website where they show some current news stories from across the political spectrum. So um, each day, the All Sides website shows current news stories, and they then provide stories from the right, from the left, and from the center. Uh, so we can see as we scroll down, they've selected a few stories. Um, and then below that, they have um, other stories that they're following with additional um, reporting from the left, center, and right. So here we have Manchin Back's Katanji Brown Jackson nomination. That was in today's um, news. And if I go back to just a few days ago, there was um, coverage of the confirmation hearings. And so um, when you select the story, it takes you to a summary, the headline roundup, and they give you then examples from the left, right, center, and right. In this case, CNN um, is representing the left, Reuters from the center, and Fox News Online from the right. So it can be informative to see how the same story or issue is presented from different political perspectives. But we can evaluate the reliability of each publication separately from its bias. Political bias is not inherently wrong or bad. Bias can also be examined from dimensions other than left to right. For example, there are perspectives such as urban versus rural, nationalist versus global, or secular versus religious. Okay, so that was the All Sides Media Bias Chart, and um, this is a Pew Research report illustrating how our own biases affect how we interpret the news. So again, just because you agree with something does not mean it is right or wrong or fake news or credible news. This Pew, Pew Research Center survey of 5,035 U.S. adults examines whether members of the public can recognize news as factual, something that's capable of being proved or disproved by objective evidence, or as an opinion that reflects the beliefs and values of whoever expressed it. The main portion of the study measured the public's ability to distinguish between five factual statements and five opinion statements. The findings reveal that even this basic task presents a challenge. The study found that a majority of Americans correctly identified at least three of the five statements in each set. But this result is only a little better than random guesses. Far fewer Americans got all five correct and roughly a quarter got most or all wrong. Even more revealing is that certain Americans do far better at parsing through this content than others. In addition to political uh, awareness, party identification plays a role in how Americans differentiate between factual and opinion news statements. Both Republicans and Democrats show a propensity to be influenced by which side of the aisle a statement appeals to most. For example, members of each political party were more likely to label both factual and opinion statements as factual when they appealed more to their political side. So here's another uh, media bias chart. This media chart is produced by Ad Fontes Media, a public benefit company. This chart also shows bias from left to right, uh, political perspectives, but this chart adds the vertical dimension to show a reliability ranking. 
This gives a framework for evaluating reliability separately from bias. The y-axis here ranges from fact reporting at the top down to contains inaccurate fabricated information at the bottom. We can see AP, Associated Press, and Reuters news services positioned at the top center of this chart, indicating their reliability doing fact reporting and their centrist bias. At and near the center top, there are many other publications that are reliably doing fact reporting. At the bottom, we show VT Veterans Today, which contains misleading information, and Natural News over here on the far right, um, which contains inaccurate fabricated information. How has the use of, of the phrase fake news changed over time? Before 2014, the term fake news was used rarely and usually applied to satirical sites. In 2014, researcher Craig Silverman noticed websites that looked like news outlets, but published entirely made up stories. By 2016, the trend of hoax sites hoodwinking so social media users with whole cloth fabrications had exploded. Silverman, then a journalist at BuzzFeed, published an analysis that found the most viral fake news stories, such as baseless report, a, ba a baseless report that Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump, were reaching wider audiences on Facebook than real news stories from real news outlets. Starting in 2017 and over the course of Donald Trump's presidency, the term largely shed its original meaning, especially for Trump's supporters, and came to mean instead any news out excuse me, any news report or outlet that made the president look bad. <clears throat> so um, media experts define make fake news as factually false information delivered in the context of a supposedly true news story that is deliberately designed to deceive readers or viewers. Why is the term fake news problematic? Scholars have described three ways in which the term fake news is used. It can imply a genre of disinformation online. It can be used by critical political actors as a label to delegitimize news media. And it can also be used to simply dismiss something as negative or false. Misinformation typically describes falsehoods of fact that are spread either purposely or accidentally. Disinformation, on the other hand, always refers to information specifically designed to mislead or deceive consumers to influence their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. Thus, fake news is disinformation, not misinformation. Claire Wardle is a scholar who studies mis- and disinformation in her own work, she recommends nuanced def definitions. Uh, Claire Wardle said she stopped using the term fake news in 2017 when it became clear that it was being weaponized by politicians around the world as an attack against the media. She has developed this continuum of seven types of mis- and disinformation. The low to high spectrum characterizes the degree of intent to deceive. So for example, satire or parody uh, does not intend to cause harm, but has the potential to fool. Contrast that with fabricated content, which is new content that is 100% false, designed to deceive and do harm. Social media platforms such as Facebook have a dramatically different structure than previous media technologies. Content can be relayed among users with no significant third-party filtering, fact-checking, or editorial judgment. An individual user with no track record or reputation can in some cases reach as many readers as Fox News, CNN, or New York Times. My friend posted it, and that's good enough for me. A little under half or 48% of US adults say that they get news from social media often or sometimes, a five percentage point decline compared with 2020, 
according to a Pew Research Center survey conducted July 26 through August 8, 2021. Social media platforms are not news publishers. They serve as gateways to news content. The January 6, 2021 siege of the Capitol illustrates the intersection between social media, democracy, and news. This Washington Post article from January 4, 2022 describes Facebook's connection to the wide distribution of election disinformation, which led to real world consequences. This chart from the Pew Research study mentioned previously shows how many Americans get their news from different social media sites. For example, 66% of US adults use Facebook here. Um, and 31% of US adults regularly get news on Facebook. One finding from the full study was that younger adults ages 18 to 29 are far more likely to get news on both Snapchat and TikTok than any other age groups, Snapchat and TikTok. There are all algorithms at work here in our news feeds. Social media platforms have more control than you may realize over your newsfeed. These algorithms are, or computer programs are designed to increase engagement in the, forms of the form of likes, shares, and comments. And an algorithm will promote disinformation and misinformation as readily as it promotes legitimate news, as long as it engages us. What role does advertising play in advertising play in this news ecosystem? Social media platforms want you to engage with their platforms to show you as many ads as possible. Uh, news sites, whether credible or untrustworthy, are funded in part by ads. Ad brokers, mainly Google and Facebook, want to place ads, and advertisers have limited controls over where their ads are shown. So this is a video on how fake news works from Wired Magazine. We're going to watch that now. At the start of 2016, in a small town called Velas in Macedonia, an 18-year-old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the U.S. election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So, Boris dropped out of high school. And he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than 100 political websites registered to Vellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the candidate. They just like the money. Trump supporters just happen to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost, and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against. But it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. 
Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published and shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads. These are Vessies. Okay. So a nonprofit company called the Global Disinformation Index or GDI has several primers on how disinformation works in the news ecosystem. This GDI study from December, 2021 shows that advertising continues to fund disinformation. This study is titled Ad Funded Climate Change Disinformation, Money, Brands and Ad Tech. GDI's study estimates that $36.7 million will go to 98 climate change disinformation websites on an annual basis. Here is an example of the well-known Johns Hopkins University advertising their master's degree in environmental science and policy, sciences and policy on a page that has an article with climate change disinformation. This illustrates that major organizations and companies sometimes inadvertently fund disinformation. The circled text at the bottom of the image indicates the ad broker is Google in this case. Here is a summary of which, of, excuse me, of which ad tech companies are profiting from climate change disinformation. So now we're going to take a look at uh, a video that talks about who starts viral misinformation. This is from the BBC. Want to know why coronavirus started? Or what might cure it? Well, search online and you'll find thousands of answers, many of which aren't true. I investigate disinformation for the BBC, and I'm often asked, who starts these rumours? And who spreads them? Well, as always, the answer isn't straightforward. So I've broken them down into five different types. One, the Joker. Lots of people have been sharing funny posts and memes online, and some of them are pretty good, but others go too far and people actually believe that they're true. Two, the scammer. This lot are looking to make money from the pandemic. Some create fake texts trying to get hold of your bank account details, or others plug dodgy advice looking to sell their remedies and cures. Three, the politician. The people in charge can also spread fake news. That includes officials and state-sponsored media from around the world. Officials in China and the US have been trading misinformation since the start of the virus, each accusing the other of deliberately creating it. Of course, neither of those claims are true. And there are concerns about foreign interference. That's when states spread misleading information abroad in order to further their own aims. But it can be very difficult to trace interference back to the people in charge or to figure out who are behind networks of fake accounts that are pushing misleading information. Four, the conspiracy theorist. These people think that nothing is as it seems. They've falsely linked 5G to coronavirus, speculated about who created it, or even suggested that coronavirus doesn't exist at all. None of these are true. These ideas have been bouncing around on the internet for a while, but they've started getting more attention as worried people look for quick answers to their questions. 5. The Insider 
There's information that apparently comes from someone you trust, an unnamed doctor, professor or hospital worker. But it turns out they don't exist. Or if they do, it seems to be a game of Chinese whispers gone wrong. And this misinformation goes viral because it's shared often by a relative in your WhatsApp group who passes it on just in case, or by a celebrity who amplifies it to their thousands of followers. Tech companies, media regulators and governments decide what happens when people start and spread misinformation. But ultimately, we're all responsible for stopping its spread. Check out our top tips for spotting and stopping misleading stuff online. And think before you share. Hal Shrooms changed my life. I used to drink. Okay, so some ways, some of the sources of misinformation. And now we're going to look at how disinformation deceives you. So why do we believe in shared disinformation? Disinformation often appeals to our emotions. Consider your reactions. People are more likely to share something that makes them angry or happy. One thing we can do is step back, take a breath, and try to reconnect with our reasoning, because that will often be enough to make us think twice about sharing disinformation. Another thing that happens is that disinformation sometimes has a patina of credibility, a kernel of truth. It looks like it could be true, and it just seems somehow plausible to us. This is particularly a risk when media is presented with an incorrect context or caption. Fake social media accounts can be run by computer programs called bots, which are used to trick newsfeed algorithms into believing that someone or some item is popular by creating fake shares, likes, or comments. When we see that something has a lot of engagement, we may be enticed to join the crowd. The illusory effect is the effect that the more we encounter something, the more we believe it. And that leads to the possibility that every time a lie is repeated, it appears slightly more plausible. And we have a confirmation bias, so that when information confirms our views, we tend to believe it. These are some of the mechanisms of disinformation at work. Information affects us and we affect it. In this comic, uh, this person is doing their own research, but they stop when they find the first result that agrees with, with what they already believe. This is our confirmation bias at work. And we have these filter bubbles. And the way that works is that algorithms reflect our choices online back into what we see on the internet. So algorithms and our confirmation bias work together to create the filter bubble of information that we are exposed to. When you only read algorithmic fees, then you're in a filter bubble of your own construction. So you're in your feed, which includes the videos you like, the brands you like, the news you like, the facts you like. Uh, so we might have good intentions of seeking out a variety of points of view or resources, but information overload is a reality. There's so much published and being thrown at us all the time. It can stop us from reading further, resulting in information avoidance. So let's say you come across a website in your newsfeed or in your own searching. A good first step to find out about the credibility of an author, organization, or website is to find out what other people on the internet are saying about them. I'm going to show you a video now about lateral reading where you check the internet to learn more about a source or about claims being made. How are you taught to evaluate the credibility of online sources? Everyone knows that information on the web may be shallow, incomplete, inaccurate, or heavily biased, and many of us have been taught to explore the features of a website to assess its credibility. 
You may have learned to ask, is this site a .com or a .org? Does the site incorporate advertisements? Was it written by someone who appears to have appropriate expertise? Are there citations to supporting evidence or research? Is the information current? While sometimes useful, these questions can also misdirect you because they rely on superficial markers of credibility and authority. For example, some .org websites may be reliable and nonpartisan, while others may be partisan political action groups or even promoters of widely debunked conspiracy theories. On the other hand, some of the most authoritative news websites are .coms with advertisements, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Relying on superficial markers to evaluate credibility can be problematic because most websites won't say, I was designed by a biased political organization with an intent to manipulate you, or I'm leaving out important information that might give you a more objective perspective on this issue, or I was written by an uninformed person with no relevant expertise. So how do we improve our ability to evaluate websites when we know that some individuals and organizations may be working hard to misrepresent themselves and misinform us? By using a skill called lateral reading. Lateral reading is a simple concept used by professional fact checkers and other savvy thinkers to judge the credibility of unfamiliar sources. While many of us judge a website by reading vertically, scrolling up and down to look for markers of credibility, or perhaps clicking on links within the site, fact checkers jump outside the site, using new browser tabs to seek additional information about the site's credibility, reputation, funding sources, and potential biases. In other words, fact checkers read laterally or horizontally across multiple web pages to get a big picture view of the site they're evaluating. They use Wikipedia, credible news sources, and other references on the web to understand what a source is and how credible it might be. They don't just take the source's word for it. For example, this news story on heavy metal music fan culture is on fizz.org, a website that may be unfamiliar to us. But if I open up a new tab, I can search for information about fizz.org and find out that it's a news aggregator that often republishes science news from across the web. I can also verify that the research discussed in the news story originated from University College London and PhD anthropology student Lindsay Bishop. By doing some homework on the source through lateral reading, we get a much better sense of what this source is and its level of credibility. We can also begin to think about its strengths and limitations from a more informed point of view. In this case, we might decide the information is reliable and a good starting point but we might also want to look beyond this brief news story and find the original research or other more in-depth scholarly information. With lateral reading, you can move beyond the superficial aspects of website evaluation and develop a more nuanced and more complete perspective on the credibility of your sources. So re reading laterally includes fact checking. There are websites that exist, exist just to check facts. Here are a few very reputable fact checking sites, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, The Washington Post, Fact Checker, and Snopes. They are all transparent in their process for how they investigate claims and come to decisions about whether a claim is true, partially true, or false. You could go to any of these fact-checking sites and feel confident that they are diligent in their process. I'm going to go to factcheck.org and we'll just leave the screen again uh, briefly. So factcheck.org is a project of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Uh, here on the home page, we see some, scroll down a little here, we see some current topics that factcheck.org has investigated and assessed. You can see their process um, for uh, 
investigating claims in the about us section, about us, our process. Which they give a, a good accounting for. So let me go back. And you, it, it's probably a good idea to try out more than one fact checking site to compare their methods and results. And you can, of course, do lateral reading about fact checking sites as well. So, okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So I highly recommend this free ebook by Mike Caulfield, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. It covers lateral reading, fact checking sites, and many other techniques for evaluating information. And I'm gonna take you to this online book now. So, the, we've jumped already to the title page with the table of contents. And um, we can see here that, uh, that Michael Caulfield has uh, the four moves, um, which uh, he talks about, he introduces and begins with the uh, first move, which is looking for previous uh, work, uh, including fact-checking sites and using Wikipedia for, for summaries or synthesis, uh, synthesis of, of information. Um, he, the second move, going upstream to the original source of information that you're encountering. Reading laterally um, with more details about how to do that, how to go about doing that. Um, Lots of tips and strategies and techniques here. And finally, there's the field guide, which um, covers a lot of other um, techniques that you need to use. For example, how to verify uh, somebody's Twitter identity or verify a Twitter account. Um, and I think there's something here about, let's see, finding out, uh, let's see avoiding confirmation bias, finding old newspapers. So there's a lot of, of good, you know, sort of variety of tips in the field guide. So this is really uh, a useful source. It goes into more detail um, than we've seen in the, the past couple of videos. And it really can guide you when you're doing um, your research. So I, I really do highly recommend this. Um, okay, so just take us back to our PowerPoint. So now we're gonna talk about images. Even if an image is not manipulated, it can be presented with a false context or incorrect caption which makes it misleading. We need to determine if a caption describes an image accurately. Because images with false context are so easy to share and reshare on social media, they are a common source of misinformation. We have an easy example of deconstructing an image-based rumor here from the SIFT, a newsletter from the News Literacy Project. Let's take a look at it. On Friday, October 16th, 2020, President Donald Trump held a campaign rally in Ocala, Florida. Later that day, someone posted a photo of a large crowd to Facebook and claimed it was the Ocala rally. But was it? Let's find out. So this is a Facebook, the Facebook page with the posting about Ocala Trump rally. And note that this image is a screenshot of a photo originally shared on Twitter. 
Is this a photo of a rally for President Donald Trump in Ocala, Florida on October 16th, 2020? Also note that this has been flagged by one of Facebook's fact-checking partners. Clicking see notice would be a super speedy route to some answers about the accuracy of this claim. But let's see if we can solve this another way. So this is, it's this circle and it says see notice. I'll just show you here, um, see notice. And that would take you, this will take you to fact-checking information about this. So question, all of the following would be potentially helpful steps for checking out this example, but which two steps are more, are more likely to help you find the provenance or origin of this photo? A, check the comments on the Facebook post for clues. B, do a web search for Trump rally, Ocala, Florida, October 16th. Do a reverse image search on the photo or D, check out the city of Ocala, Florida on Google Maps and look for this bridge. Answer, um, answers, well, the answer first is which ones are not as, as well suited to get to the origin of the photo. And that's answers B and D. So while doing a quick web search is often the best first step you can take to check out information online, in this case, a text-based search about the rally is not likely to help you find to find information about this photo. And then, um, D, looking at Ocala, Florida from above um, on Google Maps might help you confirm whether the city has a body of water or bridge that matches the photo, but it can't help you determine the provenance of the photo if it's not Ocala. So the best ways in, uh, for determining the origin of the photo are A and C. So A, check the comments on the Facebook post for clues. If the photo is out of context, there's a decent chance that someone flagged it in one of the numerous com comments on this post. That's really easy. That's a really easy step to take. And then doing a reverse image uh, search on the photo, which searches the internet for other instances of this photo is also a good step. Let's look at the comments for clues. So um, Bernard says, this picture was taken in Zurich in 2018 during the street parade. And he has a YouTube link uh, to the official street parade. And then Joe says, doesn't look like the Ocala I have been to. I don't remember the old European construction. So those are two comments to the post, um, Anthony's post about this being the Ocala Trump rally. So there were several distinct trends in the comments and we just looked at two, um, the first two, the photo of a festival in Zurich, Switzerland, and then the Western European architecture doesn't fit Ocala. Uh, and then someone else mentions further down that Ocala doesn't have a body of water or bridge that looks like that. Now let's check out that link to the Facebook's um, fact checking from Reuters. Okay, so this is the Reuters website, and here's their fact check for photo shows 2019 music festival in Zurich, Switzerland, not Trump rally in Ocala, Florida. And here they give you their evidence for that. Um, and they, you know, they take you to um, pictures, other pictures where um, shows a picture of a bridge and surrounding area. So they're just giving you the history of this, um, this photo and making the case. And then down here, we come to the verdict, um, which says false. The photo shows a 2019 music festival in Zurich, not Trump's recent rally in Ocala, Florida. So um, Reuters is giving us the final answer to that.
So unpacking memes. Unlike an article that makes a lot of claims, a meme has one or two pictures and a little bit of text. Memes require a different strategy to parse and contextualize in order to understand what they are trying to imply. I can't go into this topic in great detail, but I wanted to let you know that there are specific strategies for specific types of content, such as memes and miscaptioned or out of context images. There are also sites like Know Your Meme, where you might find background information on popular memes. For example, they debunked the ghost of Kyiv uh, meme during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, we can take a look at that. Uh, know your meme page. So this um, helps us trace and parse the origin claims and accuracy of memes. So they show all the different places that, or many of the places this has been shared and then the process of um, debunking it. Um, and you can search know your meme for other, you know, memes that you're encountering. It's a good place to come for this kind of information. Unfortunately, we now may encounter sophisticated disinformation in the form of manipulated media. Reuters has teamed up with Facebook to create a free course on identifying and tackling manipulated media. Um, and here is the beginning of the course outline. You know, asking how can media be manipulated and covering different topics, including this. Um, which is, uh, these are Im not images of real models. They are artificial faces that have been generated using deep learning technology. Deep fakes can be used to create false identities. The Reuters website also has examples of fake video that I encourage you to take a look at. Let's take a look at another type of tricky disinformation, conspiracy theories. This tool was presented by Vanessa Otera at um, a media literacy workshop on conspiracy theories and memes. These indicators are red flags in rhetoric common to conspiracy theories. It explicitly states that it is telling the truth and or everyone else is lying to you. It contains short, conclusory opinion statements. It is organized as a list of questions or hypotheses. It puts the burden on you to answer the questions. It asks you to prove a negative, which is often impossible. It suggests an insidious plot by someone, media elites, corporations, government, but doesn't say exactly what the plot is or provide any evidence for it. Elevates the credibility of one expert who goes against the consensus of their entire expert peer group. For example, one scientist versus all the other scientists and claims that being taken down for promoting misinformation is censorship, censorship, which therefore proves that the item taken down is actually true. So in review, here's how to check the news. Consider the source, check the author, check the date, check your biases, read beyond, are there supporting sources? Is it a joke? Like, is it the onion? Um, ask the experts. Uh, uh, you can use a subject wiki, a uh, fact checking site, ask a librarian, um, uh, just do consult experts um, or get other opinions using lateral reading, other perspectives and other uh, facts. So um, the, I wanna give you um, the uh, code phrase for workshop credit in case your instructor has uh, told you to attend or asked you 
uh, to attend the workshop um, and has offered uh, extra credit. So lateral reading is the uh, phrase for this workshop. And you want to jot that down. That's what you'll need to tell your instructor. Now, I am going to um, go out of this um, PowerPoint. And or actually, you know what? I'm going to take it to the library website. Um, and or actually, you know what? I want to point out that there is a, a, a site called Fake Out. It's actually a, a quiz um, for uh, guessing or determining whether uh, this, a news story you're seeing is uh, true or false. And um, the link is here, um, uh, newsliteracy.ca slash fake out slash round dash one. And I've just, um, if you go to this site, you can uh, take these, um, take the little quiz and um, you might want to remember to, to do your lateral reading. I think it really, you'll see that it helps a lot to, um, to determine if something is true or false. So uh, sorry, I forgot that for a moment, but it's, I think it's a, a fun way for you to explore um, actual stories and try to figure out if they're true or false. And you can use some of the techniques we've talked about. Okay, so we're going to go to the library website now, and I just want to show you briefly that um, we do have news sources here that you can use that are um, generally considered reliable. Of course, you always have to think critically, and um, you know, and have some skepticism, healthy skepticism. But this is a good place to go um, for uh, more established news sources. And so I'm going to start by taking you to the databases. And um, under all databases, you can see this is an alphabetical list, but you'll see, for example, that we have different newspaper collections. And if you read through, they're all uh, indicated in the title that they're news collections. So we one is in that's especially helpful is the US News Stream, which includes um, some of the newspapers you've seen mentioned in this workshop. New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, including the Los Angeles Times, et cetera. So that's our, our databases. You can also get to that quickly if you go to our research guides and um, go down to fake news and disinformation alphabetically. This guide um, includes a link to the news, our, uh, news databases I just mentioned. So find, find news in SMC library subscription databases. You just have to log on to these with your SMC uh, Canvas or Corsair Connect uh, credentials. And so this is a list of um, those newspaper databases. And you might find some other interesting things on this library guide, research guide. And then we have a list of, we have links to um, uh, educational or tutorials on our library resources in our YouTube channel. So I, it's from our homepage, you just click on YouTube channel and then these are the most recent, including US Newsstream. There's a, a tutorial there, um, but videos, Clicking on videos gives you the full archive of all of our uh, instructional um, videos. Some are you know, very short, 10 minutes, five minutes, some are an hour long. But I think you might find those useful. So the last thing is just to remember that we're here to help you and you can come to the library. Our hours are here. You can ask us online and we can chat with you um, and take you on a Zoom uh, tour of resources that are relevant to your current research. So I hope that you have found this useful and can now start thinking about ways that you can 
you know, evaluate the news that you're looking at and evaluating sources of news. Um, and remember that we're here to help. So thank you very much for, um, for watching this video and um, have a great day. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you.